Um, okay, what we're going to do here now, can you guys see, can you guys see the board there okay? The whiteboard? Yeah. Can you see what's written on there? Yeah, red seal blocks. Yeah, okay, just as long as you can see that. I might be out of, out of camera range here for a bit, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, mute you, and, but you'll still be able to hear me, but I won't be able to hear you. Okay. And every so often I'll stop and then, uh, and then ask you guys if you got any questions. Okay. Okay, so don't think I'm forgetting you. I'm just going to put you, put you out of sight for a bit. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Okay, now can you still hear me? You can? Okay, good. Okay, we're going to start here now. We've got one more guy missing, but we're not going to wait. We have too much to cover. Okay, fellas, we'll get going here now. Um, my name is Terry Hockley. I will have been in the trade on June the first 50 years. And I started the trade here at Edmonton. So I've been, I've been in the trade 50 years, and I'm pretty well worked on any type of building want to think of. Um, I taught for eight years in uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, plumbing, pipe fitting, and gas fitting. And uh, I must admit, this is the first time I've, I've worked for a department, but I think it's uh, a great uh, way of getting you guys up to speed to pass that red seal. If there's anything at all during the, the day that, or during the, the instruction that you want me to go over, don't. Don't feel you have to wait. Just, just uh, help me and say that I, I didn't understand that, or I'd like to to go over that again, and I'll gladly do it. And as far as I'm concerned, no question is is is, is a dumb question. Like some guys are worried about asking a question, thinking everybody else is going to look down on them. But but don't. Just if you got a question, ask it, and maybe we can all learn from it. The the exam now is a lot harder than it was previously, because they have added a lot of uh, new um, items on it, and they've taken away a lot of the welding that used to be on the exam. <coughs> what, what I feel, about five years, six years ago, they put all this welding into the pipe fitting uh, curriculum. <coughs> it was a disaster. We're not welders, we're pipe fitters, or uh, steam fitters, pipe fitters, whatever you want to, want to say. So they took a bunch of that out, but they inserted uh, a number of, of different uh, items, and quite frankly, a lot of them we will never ever work on. But the fact is, we've got to know them in order to pass the exam. So what we have now on the red seal, we have nine blocks, the first one, occupational skills, and I'm going to lay them out here for you in a bit just to give you an idea of what's involved with them. Layout and fabrication, blueprint reading, rigging, steam, heating, cooling, process piping, renewable energy, commissioning, testing, and maintenance. Now those three on the bottom, they make up 20% of the exam. So you've got to at least um, know a little bit about each one in order to get through that exam. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. If we break, uh, if we break these down, uh, these blocks down, I'll tell you what's, uh, what you're supposed to uh, be uh, up to speed on. And there's there's a pile of pile of uh, different items in each in each one. It's going to boggle your mind with the amount of knowledge they're, they're expecting us to know. But that's just the way it is. Okay, block A, um, perform safety related functions. I think 
pretty well we know what they're talking about there. Uses and maintains tools and equipment, organizes work. Uh, drawings and specifications, or Block B. Um, they, uh, Okay, block B. I got them. I got them. I got them uh, turned around there, guys. Sorry. Um, block B is actually uh, drawings and specifications. I've got it reversed there. Uh, block C, layout, fabrication, installation, performs layout and fab, performs common installation processes, installs sys tracing systems, which a lot of this is meant that. Uh, block D is rigging. Hoisting, block E, steam system installation, block F, heating, cooling, and process system installation, and that is the biggest one of all. Renewable energy, install geothermal, install solar heating, and install heat recovery systems. Testing and commissioning, prepare systems for test, performs tests, and commission systems. Maintenance and repair, Maintain system and performs repairs. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of a theory that we have to, to go through in order to get up to speed on these things. And what I'd like you to do, if you can, we're going to start fairly simple today. We're not going to overload you with anything. There's. A, there's some modules, and I think it's in your third binder, and it's uh, classed as code requirements. That's the uh, that's the module code requirements. You got that one? heating boilers. So highlight that one. And uh, the, the bottom of that first paragraph, it said, this code also interprets the rules when questions arise. This code terminates at the first weld, flange, or threaded joint off of the boilers. 
Okay, which we, any, uh, buddy know there's a different name for that? Nozzle? That's what you call a first connection off the boiler is the boiler nozzle. Okay, so just highlight that one. Uh, page uh, six, um, it gives you some explanations there, but we're not going to get into all those different articles. It's, uh, it's, it's way over the top. So seven, eight, and then we get into nine. And this is section six. And this is uh, Boiler and Pressure Vessels Code, Recommended Rules for the Care and Operation of Heating Boilers. Highlight that one. That's the two really that we have to be uh, aware of for, for uh, boilers, the, the operation of them and the actual um, um, the code pertaining to the, uh, the building of them. Um, go over to uh, page 11 and at the top of the page ASME B31 is the code for pressure piping and this code is all minimum design requirements all these codes are minimum codes none of them are anything other than minimum so that's something you'll remember and then down in the next paragraph the piping industry is covered by the separate sections of the code B31.1 highlight that one B31.3 chemical plant and petroleum refinery piping. Uh, highlight number four, liquid petroleum transportation piping systems. And those are the, the three main ones that we seem to see on tests all the time. I wouldn't worry about the rest of them because we're really, we're not really not into them that much. <coughs> um, down at the bottom of the page, it uh, tells you that it, uh, Section 1 of the SME Code was one of the first codes and standards in the United States. Today the code covers the design and construction of power boilers, heating boilers, nuclear plant components, and any pressure vessel that operates at a pressure of at least 15 PSI. And that, uh, the big thing there is 15 PSI, okay? The rest of this stuff is all about nothing. Or we don't have to be aware of anything. Uh, page 12. Uh, they mention uh, section 4 again and section 6. Um, <coughs> they go on to me uh, mention section 7, guidelines for the care of power boilers. We're really, uh, we're really not going to get into that one. And section 8 rules for construction of pressure vessels. Just be aware that most of all these systems usually come under some ASME um, section, but the ones you have to be aware of is 4 and 6. <coughs> and then they go on here, section 9, welding and brazing qualifications. <coughs> uh, section 10, fiber, uh, fiber reinforced plastic pressure vessels. No, number 11, we're not into either. So, basically four and six dollars. Page 14, ASME stamps, most important. The AMSE code is the only code known to require a third party independent inspection. Okay, it's the only code that requires third party independent inspection. And here is some of the code stamps that must be uh, stamped on, on the vessel or on the boiler or whatever we're, uh, whatever we're dealing with. An S, an E, or an M, or an E. This uh, figure six, I wouldn't worry about that one, uh, or figure seven, but the other one that you have to know is V at the bottom. And this is what you'll see on safety belts. It's got to have a V on it in order to be uh, up, to, up to par. Okay, so those ones there are the basic ones that you have to be uh, 
cognizantly. Jurisdictional boundaries, I've never seen that come up anywhere at all. Uh, I'm not going to get into that one. Uh, <clears throat> over on page 16, there's a little uh, thing on the top here that's quite interesting. The current issues of the AISC and the ASME codes have not sanctioned these boundary definitions, in other words, between what code takes precedence over another. And what it goes on to say is that the engineer shall specify in the technical specifications the boundaries of the building structure, so that if there's a dispute on what code uh, relates to what part of the building, then the engineer has to get involved. Uh, down at the bottom of the page, American Society for Testing and Materials, the AMSTM. Uh, that's been, uh, that was put together in 1898, and it was basically to um, control the manufacture and the specifications of piping, fittings, etc., uh, etc. Et it had nothing to do with the boilers and <coughs> that part of it. You got ASHRAE, I don't know if you've ever heard of ASHRAE, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. Basically, they have, um, they have reign over the heating, refrigeration, air conditioning and ventilation. They write pretty well all the codes and uh, specifications for refrigeration. Uh, American Welding Society, and here again we're talking about the American Welding Society. We have one here in Canada, and we see that as we go through. But here again it's for, uh, basically just for welding. PFT or PFI, forget about that one. Um, Uniform Boiler and Pressure Vessels Law Society, uh, forget about that one. Building codes, of course we have the Canada Building Code here in Canada. Alberta Boilers, we're not, we're not dealing with Alberta here, we're dealing with Canada on a whole. So we don't really recognize anything that is in these uh, modules that relates to Alberta because your test is, <coughs> is purely on a, a national basis. Uh, over on 18, <coughs> Canadian Standards, CSA, and I think we've all been familiar with that. Then we go down to pick, er, number seven. And this is something that you guys might have missed uh, on, uh, on what you had before. But every boiler and pressure vessel sold and installed in Canada requires a Canadian registration number or a CRN. Canadian registration number. Now, the other th thing that goes along with that is that each province has a number that goes <coughs> at the back end of that CRN. British Columbia is one, Alberta two, and so on and so forth. So that if the, the unit was uh, built and uh, was uh, certified in Alberta, it would be CRN point two okay, or whatever the number is. And here to give you an example, uh, for example, if a design is given the number 832 by the regulatory authority, as in the province of Alberta, the CRM would read 823.2. And then if another province were to get on board, then their number would go behind Alberta, 823.28, 2.8.1, uh, etc., etc. You get the idea. It must have a CRN number on it, and each province has a has a uh, numeral that identifies it. <coughs> Canadian Welding Bureau, uh, like I mentioned before, this is the uh, Canadian part of that uh, welding uh, group, part of CSA. CWB is part of CSA, and as such, the regulations set by the CWB are considered to be the standards for all welding in Canada. And of course, 
the occupational health and safety, which we all are well aware of, especially those of us that are working in, uh, in the, uh, out in the field. Safety has become a great uh, big thing right now. Um, there is a little uh, bit of an exam at the back there. Um, I'm not going to get you to do it now. You can do it at your leisure, at night or whatever, but it just helps to um, it just helps to uh, you to remember what we what we took over that, and that's basically what I'm going to be doing. Is going through this like this, giving you things to study, and and uh, that way we don't have to waste time on all that other. Stuff. Is that okay with you so far? Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Next one. is safe work practices. We're all up to speed on this, I'm sure. Number two, <clears throat> and uh, you'll see down here at the bottom of that page, workplace hazards are categorized into four main areas which are biological, chemical, ergonomic, and physical. And of course they, they uh, break it down here on the next page, biological, any type of living organisms that can cause disease in humans, and it gives you some ideas of what they're talking about. Chemical hazards uh, affects health by contact with either the inside or outside of the body. Ergonomic, of course, uh, occurs when a job tool procedure or the work environment are not properly designed for the worker. And the physical hazards affects health by contact with either the inside or the outside of the body. And then they go on to talk about noise, vibration, cold, radiation, blah, blah, blah. You should have an idea what is contained in each one of those four hazards. Biological hazards uh, on the next page, page four, um, they're listed as uh, bacteria, fungal, or viral. Okay, and then they break those down into different areas and where you could uh, conceivably uh, come in contact with them. Uh, rules for lifting objects, back safety, uh, we'll keep going, get over to page 6, radiant energy, and some of the most serious arc welding hazards are the harmful light rays emitted from the arc and the oxy fuel flame. And a little farther down, both visible and invisible light rays are given off. And it can be divided into three types, which are visible light, ultraviolet, and infrared. And I would like you to highlight those. Visible light are those you can see. 
causes eye strain, or in extreme cases, a temporary or permanent blindness. Make sure you've got that one highlighted. Ultraviolet, they are invisible. They cause burns to expose skin and blistering of the eyeballs, and is more common with electric arc welding. It's sometimes called arc flash. Okay, highlight that one as well. And then we go with the infrared. They are also invisible. They penetrate deeply and can cause temperature increases and burns to expose spin, uh, skin. They may also penetrate the interior of the eye, can cause retina damage. Okay, so those three make sure you know what each one will do to you. And then they've added this X-ray and gamma rays in here now. And basically what they say, if you want to get sterile, just stand in front of a, an X-ray camera when they're doing non-destructive testing of wells, and that will do the job. Stay away from any areas uh, that, that, that these uh, units are being used in unless you have the proper protective equipment. Now, the next one, we'll go over to page 8 uh, on burns. And the type of burns is a couple, surface or minor burns, and major burns. With surface or minor burns, they are called a first degree burn. Outer, lay of the, uh, outer layers of the skin are damaged. And the second one is a major burn, which is classified as a second or third degree burn. And they're deep burns with all layers of the skin destroyed. So make sure you've got those uh, highlighted, two different types, first degree and second and third degree. Page 9, I think we're all familiar with the SDR, stop, drop and roll, if you happen to get uh, uh, your clothing on fire or, or something of that nature, or somebody else has uh, their clothing on fire, that's basically what you want to do with them. Uh, stop them, drop them to the ground, and roll them till the flames are out. SDR. <clears throat> frostbite and hypothermia. We all know what frostbite is because we've probably all had it. Treatment. Immediate treatment of frostbite is to cover the affected area with other body surfaces or warm clothing. Do not rub or massage the area. Immerse the affected part in warm, not hot, water until the frozen tissue is thawed. Okay, that's for frostbite. Hypothermia, a little different story. This is serious. This kills you. The symptoms of hypothermia include an uncontrollable shivering, dizziness, and lightheadedness. Headiness. <coughs> To treat hypothermia, the body temperature must be raised slowly. Give the victim warm liquids that contain no caffeine and make sure the victim gets medical attention as soon as possible. Okay, so they're giving you some ideas on how to treat frostbite and hypothermia. Noise hazards. And we'll go over to page 10. Now usually uh, the, the, uh, the intensity of the noise is usually measured in units called decibels. And here's an example of some decibel levels at different uh, areas of the work site, or et cetera, et cetera. The bottom of the page, there's a, there's a clause there I want you to highlight. The maximum permitted sound level for an eight hour day is 85 dBA. And hearing protection should be worn if the sound level is above 85. Personal protective equipment. <clears throat> uh, second paragraph from the bottom. Your employer is responsible for making available at the work site any personal protective equipment specified by a provision in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Okay, your employer is uh, responsible 
Yeah, come on in. Yeah. You must be uh, Jason. Yeah. There's some books up here for you, Jay. When you get a, a chance, we're working on a book called Safe Work Practices. And what I'm getting you to do is to highlight the portions of this that I think is pertinent to what you need to study. So your employer is responsible to supply you with all safety equipment and at the bottom of the page it is your responsibility to use the equipment provided for you. They're very clear on that. If you don't wear it, then the onus is on you. Now the next two pages is pretty well, I mean that's standard, uh, standard stuff, problem 13, eye protection, safety glasses, full face visor, uh, page 14, uh, welding goggles, clear goggles, here again it's, it's uh, pretty standard stuff. Um, there's one here on page 15. Um, special filter plates, sometimes called filter lenses, are available in various shades ranging from 1, which is the lightest, and 14, which is the darkest. Okay, 1 to 14. The filter plate absorbs mostly harmful ultraviolet and infrared rays, as well as a large amount of visible light. <coughs> There's a little thing at the bottom of the page, and I, uh, I'll get you to highlight it. I, I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but as a general rule, if after welding for a few minutes you lift your helmet and see light spots, your lens is probably too light. If you see dark spots, your lens is likely too dark. Okay, so. Uh, page 16. Uh, there's nothing there that I can see. Page 17, we're talking about uh, protective clothing. I think we're all familiar with this, but we'll highlight it anyway. Second paragraph down, best clothing materials for welding and cutting are leathers, wool, and denim because they repel sparks and slag. Leather offers the best protection against sparks and molten slag. The only problem with leather is that it might get a little warm in warm weather. The same protective quality can be achieved by wearing leather aprons, capes, or sleeves that allow the body heat to escape. Wool is more desirable for cold temperatures, and denim um, is a very popular type of clothing worn for most indoor and outdoor welding operations. Okay, so just be aware of, of, of that clause there. Over on 18, welding gloves, welders leather gauntlet style gloves provide the best protection because they cover up your wrists. Most leather is chrome tanned, meaning chromium salts are used in the tanning process and this makes the leather tougher and more resistant to abrasion. Uh, footwear, here again, every job site seems to have a different idea of what your footwear should, should be, like a dagger, we had to have metatarsal uh, protective uh, shields on our boots, which is, which is a pain, but that was, their, uh, that was their thinking. The only problem was, in the winter you didn't have to, only in the summer. The winter you could wear anything. And uh, here they're telling us that we should have footwear that have electrically non-conductive soles. 19, not much on there. Okay, now we're getting into uh, fire hazards and methods of fire prevention. <coughs> and at uh, the bottom, the three things really that we have to be have to know about elements of fire: we have to have air, we have to have fuel, and we have to have an ignition source. 
That's the three, three things we need to have fire. <clears throat> the fuel can be any number of things. Um, under oxygen, the second sentence in there, it says, in order to be sustained, fire requires an atmosphere with at least 16% oxygen. If you have any less than that, what they're saying is, it's not going to burn. And of course, heat of ignition could be anything. It could be a spark, it could be, you know, temperature, there's all sorts of uh, things that could be the ignition source. But the main thing is, elements of fire, air, fuel, and an ignition source. We go over to page 22. Now these ones you're going to have to try and uh, remember. These are the classes of fire extinguishers, uh, what they're good for, and what the color of them are, or what the color of the symbol is. Class A, B, C, D, and K. Class A, ordinary combustibles. Paper, cloth, rubber, etc., etc. The class A fire symbol is a green triangle uh, as shown below. A green triangle for class A. Class B, flammable liquids and gases. And these are best extinguished by smothering or slowing the release of vapors or interrupting the reaction with dry chemical or foam agents. So most of your class B extinguishers are dry chem or foam. They can be uh, identified by a large B in a square and that square is going to be red. Class C electrical and here again they're saying that the uh, the, uh, the extinguisher should be a dry chemical or a carbon dioxide agent. This is a 